Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. My co-host today, family physician Dr. Elizabeth Cozine. Tracy McRae is away. Hi. Dr. Cozine, nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me with you. So we're going to talk about ovarian cancer, and we have previously talked about it uh, on this program pre- before, um, and we've talked about what a uh, difficult disease it is to treat, and the fact that it is fortunately relatively uncommon. Only about 22,000 women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer every year. But the prognosis is suboptimal, not as good as we'd like it to be. And in fact, less than 50% of women live for five years after they're diagnosed. How do doctors decide the best treatment? And what are some of the factors that influence the outcome in patients with ovarian cancer? Joining us in studio today is Mayo Clinic gynecologic oncologist surgeon, Dr. Amanika Kumar. Welcome, Dr. Kumar. Thank you so much for having me. Good to have you back. Gynecologic surgery, does that mean that you only operate on women? Well, I only operate on people with female genitalia, I should say. That would be women, (laughs) wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, yes and no, huh? Yes and no, right? There are transgender patients who Mm -hmm. define themselves as male and might have surgery for gynecologic organs. Do you like what you do? I love what I do. I mean, it's a challenging job, um, and... But there are a few jobs in the world that you get to go in every day and you know that the time you spent away from your home, away from your family was spent in a worthwhile way. And I leave every day being feeling very privileged to do what I do and doing it at the Mayo Clinic. So uh, ovarian cancer, we know that uh, many women present uh, with late stage disease. They're, it wasn't diagnosed early on when it might have been more curable. And why is that? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the biggest challenges with ovarian cancer, and some part of it is because it's rare. There's not a good screening test, so we've done lots of studies looking for screening tests similar to like what we do for mammography and breast cancer or colonoscopy for colon cancer, pap smears for cervical cancer. Sure. But for ovarian cancer, there's not a good effective screening test. And the second issue is there's not a lot of symptoms. So the symptoms that people have are really vague, and I think this presents a really big diagnostic challenge for people like our primary Absolutely. care doctors, mm-hmm. um, where patients come in and they have vague complaints like abdominal pain, bloating, Sometimes they get full kind of early. And who hasn't had that symptom right. over the last month? Right. And so trying to distinguish, you know, I, I kind of in some ways have the easy part where they already come to me with a diagnosis. But if you're a family care doc or a p- primary care doc and you're seeing this patient, you have to figure out, is this the problematic kind of abdominal pain or is this just normal daily abdominal right. pain? Right. And when they come to see me, they're usually pretty undifferentiated and but worried about ovarian cancer because they do hear about this sort of statistic that, you know, fewer than 50 percent of women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer live for five years after the diagnosis. Tell us a little bit about those statistics. Why is it so grim. Yeah. So at the end of the day, even though we do have some treatments that are effective and we can usually, but not always, get patients into remission, because of the late stage of diagnosis, we have disease that's usually spread throughout the abdomen, sometimes outside of the abdomen into the chest cavity or other parts of the body. And so treatment is challenging and cancer cells can evade the tra- the traditional treatments of surgery and chemotherapy. And it, the disease often recurs. So while I can get someone can get into remission with our traditional therapies, their risk of it coming back and then not being curable is quite high. Dr. Cozine, has any a woman, a female, ever come into your office and, and you said to yourself, I bet she's got ovarian cancer? And if so, what was it about the, the history or maybe your examination that made you suspect that? I've had it on my differential before, and actually I have yet to diagnose ovarian cancer. Um, I've That's thought about recurrence. Exactly. Yeah. Although the the woman who is postmenopausal, who is perhaps you know late 50s early 60s who has new bloating or new early satiety that's being full shortly after eating and really hadn't had this symptom before so that kind of raises my feelers a little bit and the main thing that I want to do is not ignore those types of symptoms and say oh we should look into this and so I'll usually order for example pelvic ultrasound yeah and that's really important and like you said I think it's becoming more common in the public discourse Mm -hmm. to know about these symptoms but I, I think there's a lot of people who didn't even know there were symptoms of ovarian cancer. A lot of patients come to me and say, well, if I have so much cancer, why don't I have pain? Or why don't I have more symptoms? And I think patients then, be the lack of symptoms, the lack of sort of screening tests that have shown anything, then also lead to the sense of shock when they say, well, I was just healthy and doing my normal life, mm-hmm. and turns out I have an advanced cancer. 
But there's plenty of room for the ovarian cancer to grow in the abdomen before it actually pushes on anything enough that it causes symptoms, right? Exactly right. So yeah. when you talk about treatment, um, you they come to you with a diagnosis. How do you outline the options, and how do you and the patient decide what's best for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, if we're talking about just advanced ovarian cancer, which is the majority of patients, so patients who are stage 3C or 4, which means that the disease has left the pelvis and has spread throughout the abdomen and sometimes into the chest cavity, mm. I tell patients that, for the most part, treatment is a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. And there are some nuances on how we decide, do we do surgery first? We call that primary cytoreductive surgery, meaning surgery that goes in and tries to take out as much of the tumor as possible. And then we follow that with chemotherapy. So that's option one. A second option is to start with chemotherapy, let the tumor shrink, do surgery, and then do some more chemotherapy after. Of course, there's always the option where there might be a patient who says, I, I don't want to treat this. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an advanced cancer. I've lived my life. And, and it's a pretty rare case, but it's important that patients know, you know, when you get a diagnosis like this and you feel really robbed of your control, that really you are still the person who gets to make decisions about your health and your body. And there are some patients who will choose not to do any treatment. So what are some of the factors that are within a patient's control, for example, what they eat or how active they are that might actually influence the treatment or how they respond to treatments? Yeah, and, and this is the area we look at a lot. So the, the thing is, what I always tell patients is for everything we do, there's risks and benefits, especially for surgery. You know, there are a lot of risks with surgery, but there's a lot of benefit. We think that if we can get someone to the operating room and take out as much disease as possible, upfront as a first step that we can lead to the longest benefit from a survival standpoint. So the longest survival. But there's a cost to that surgery. This is highly complicated surgery. It includes operating in all four quadrants of the abdomen, meaning I'm gonna it's not just doing a hysterectomy, but it's often doing complicated surgery up around the liver, around the spleen, in the upper part of the abdomen. It usually requires a bowel resection. Sometimes these surgeries can last six to eight hours with a high rate of blood loss. And so th that being said, it's also very effective surgery. And so there's two things that I look at. Number one, I wanna make sure I can do a meaningful surgery. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna go into the operating room and then leave the operating room having put someone through a lot of risk and a lot of surgery without being able to take out the majority of disease. Mm -hmm. So the first is I wanna make sure, is her disease resectable? Can I take out the most amount of disease that I can? The second question is, is she fit enough for surgery? Mm -hmm. Because there are a high risk of complications, and so we wanna avoid complications, and we also wanna make sure that if you were to have a complication, you can recover from mm -hmm. that complication. So we look at lots of factors. It's not a perfect science, but we look at things like age, you know, how old is the person? Um, we look at the albumin, and that is a nutritional marker, mm -hmm. and it can be very affected by cancer and the fluid that develops in the abdomen. We look at their other comorbidities, mm -hmm. so other medical history that they have, like heart disease or clots in their leg and lungs and how that influences their overall being. We look at their weight, and then we also look at their functional status. Mm -hmm. You know, how fit is the patient? Does she do all of her activities? Does she walk around? Or has the disease caused a lot of debilitation? Is this someone who really can't even get out of bed and mm -hmm. can't really function? If they can't function, it's gonna be really hard to get through a big surgery. A lot of factors to consider. Now, I know you have a particular interest in sarcopenia and the effect it has on a patient's prognosis. Tell us what sarcopenia is. Yeah, so this is a new area. So sarcopenia is a loss of skeletal muscle mass along with a loss of physical function. And so it represents something that is age-related and it's cancer-related, but it's not a perfect correlation. And we're interested in seeing how do patients' muscle mass uh, affect their overall outcomes, and then how can we influence that muscle mass and potentially change outcomes. All right, ovarian cancer, it's often diagnosed late. Less than 50% of women live for five years after a diagnosis. A thorough assessment of the patient is absolutely necessary to do determine the appropriate treatment plan, and maintaining good muscle strength, avoiding sarcopenia, and good nutrition can improve the prognosis in women with late-stage disease, which unfortunately most of them are. 
Our thanks to Mayo Clinic Gynecologic Surgeon, Dr. Monica Kumar.